everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Review. Today, we're going to be talking about the second and third episodes of the Loki series. Uh, I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, what's going on? Not much. Halfway point of a show, and as always with these Marvel shows, it feels like we get to the midway point, and, and it, there's so much for them to do in the second right? half of these shows to make it feel like we, we got there. But yeah, and we'll get into this, the third episode, uh, which we both agree we have the same sort of uh, same uh, feelings towards it. Um, but let's start with the second episode. The second episode to me had me hype at the end of it. The second episode really touched on a number of themes, one of them being trust, and another for me, uh, how Loki is and his sort of um sort of the way he is and i think despite whatever actions he may take which would you can which you would consider either good or bad there's always uh, a reason why he does what he does ultimately to get to his whatever goal he sets out for himself um to me the second episode was the best of the three thus far. Um, so what, let's get into what has happened in this second episode. So the second episode, we start off with them taking Loki on a uh, sort of mission, I guess, or, uh, or, or to recon or whatever, to find out what, um, transpired in the opening sequence of that episode, which was uh, Sylvie um, using one of the Minutemen to take out the rest of the group. And she proceeds to take her with her to wherever she was. We find out later where she's taking them. Um, Brian, what were your thoughts on the sequence after where they take Loki and they're in this, um, in the prior uh, sequences uh, um, uh, timeline and what took place there. And describe to me what your thoughts were in terms of how they went about um, with the Loki character and that whole scene moving forward. This is the scene where they were trying first brought him along to try to catch the variant to so sort of investigate. Yeah, yeah. And he kind of tries to trick them, like he tries yes. to double, does it like yes. a weak double cross. Yeah, no, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. So I've seen analogies, and I agree with you. This episode is, in my mind, the best of the three, and it's not really that close, at least of the ones we've seen so far. I I've seen analogies. Everyone plays the Doctor Who card, and I get it. Um, I actually thought this this sequence in this episode had a lot of echoes of the X Files to me. A little bit of like you know Mulder and Scully in the field, and like one of them knows a lot more than the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then the other kind of is there for a specific set of expertise, and so in this yeah, case, yeah. like Loki's kind of he's kind of playing the Scully role. Like I'm the forensic guy. I can see these things that yeah, other yeah. people can't. But in reality, he's just trying to set up his own his own game. Um, and I like the fact that Owen Wilson, you know, they, they put him in that position of, I know more than you because I know you and I know all the versions of you. And, yeah. and that allows me to kind of pick up on these little nuances. And I know you're tricking us. I know you're playing. He, he, but so. he had him for a moment. Yeah. And he says that he's like, he <laughs> yeah. thought it. And then he's like, oh, and then it, something triggered like a keyword or something triggers his memory. The trigger like, was, oh, just, yeah, the trigger was, um, him getting an audience with the timekeepers yeah <laughs> that's what like oh never mind he's trying to trick us yeah exactly so i think that what that kind of had a little bit of echoes of that and then as i said the the oh and then the, the if you're talking about the part where they show him the other versions of himself which i thought was hilarious oh, yeah. i think that's fantastic um I, my, my my favorite is actually the tour de france one just because <laughs> I don't know if they did this deliberately, but you're talking about an event where literally everyone is cheated. Yeah, everyone yeah. is cheated in real life. <laughs> and so when I saw that, that, it reminded that. me. 
It would it reminded me of Lance Lance Armstrong immediately exactly. when I saw that. So I was like, of course, of, of all sporting events that Loki would want to win, he wins the one that everyone cheats in anyway. So, um, <laughs> no, so I thought that was, that was pretty fun. And their dynamic obviously um, stepped up in this one. So I, one thing I really liked about this episode is in the first one, it was all, you know, Loki's the fish out of water and Mobius is kind of the, you know, his handler, if you will. In the second one, as I said, whether it's that Mulder Scully dynamic, they were more like partners. Like they were working together, albeit uneasily, in sort of doing some detective work. And I actually, that was part of my favorite part of the show was when they kind of started to go down the strains of Loki was actually looking at the information and trying to decipher kind of what was what was mm-hmm. going on. Even as we were getting clued into, yeah, he he has his own reasons for for doing that so yeah no i i really like the way they played off each other a little differently in episode two yeah. versus episode one it's kind of i like the uh instances where um mobius and um, loki are talking i like still i like hearing those conversations because they're both trying to be smarter than the other and so it's interest is like to see I like to see them go back and forth and, and because there's a lot of information that you can get from the, those conversations, which is that's why I find it very interesting. And in those moments where he's looking at those files, especially of Asgard and the Ragnarok event, there's always a moment of sadness that he experiences, mm-hmm. which is kind of dope to see. Because Loki, you know, again, with when it comes to who he is, he's a trickster. And there's always a motive. And he will do anything, which is be nice or play nice, just to further along his plan. And that's just who he is and that's his nature. But he has a soft side. But the nature of him will only allow him to experience those moments very rarely when that trigger comes up. But he ultimately has a plan, you know, depending on what it is that's happening in his environment, he's always trying to get up, be on top. Um, so I like I like the fact that they always throw that in when it, whenever he's alone and Ragnarok is me- or um, Thor or anybody from Asgard is mentioned. Yeah, the writing in this show is excellent. And he actually touches on it when he says this idea of no one is, you know, no one is inherently totally evil. No one is inherently totally good. He effectively is very self-aware when he says that. And I think of the villains we have in the MCU and in general, what makes Loki more interesting than most is that most of the time when we have a good villain, you know, so Killmonger is a good example. It's usually we can empathize with the objective, but not the method. And so- correct. They get on a path, the path we generally don't like, and they stay on the path that's pretty bad, but we kind of see like, all right, the end game, eh, I kind of get where you're coming from. The difference with Loki is on the path, he flips Oh yeah, good to bad. That's the key difference. He actually does legitimately good things along the way. He's always a guy with a conscience, which is why you can never totally call him a villain. And then you see that these, every time we bring up, they, they show these memories of these things, it touches him in a way that I think for a lot of the other villains, quote unquote, we've encountered in the show or it, not in the show, in the universe would not have occurred. And so yeah. it's what makes him inherently fun to, to use as a character, because in any given episode, you don't know, like he could legitimately <laughs> be on the side of good and he could legitimately be the guy coming to conquer earth. Like it just yeah. Yeah. It works in a way that most characters can't pull it off. So I think that you, you see that in this episode you know, both sides of it, I think pretty, pretty effectively. Yeah. I like also, um, when they, he finally figures it out and they, they, they sort of do his test run of his theory. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a very great, uh, scene there. And then we go into the future where they're actually able to sort of, I, I I'm still quite unclear in terms of how exactly they're able to figure out. I understand that the Kablooey bubble gum came out in a certain time period at a certain disaster. They may have been the certain disaster, but 
I guess that was the biggest one in that era in that time before or after Kablooey came out. I think also, I think Loki points out there's some, because the, the store, right? There's something about the supply resupply where he makes the point of like this particular location as it relates to that particular event. You could not only hide there, but you could restock and re-equip constantly in the other places you couldn't. I think that was the other sort of point he was making as to why it should be there. And that's, and they're, they're, he's obviously right. Or he's like, that's what I kind of like, that's what I would do. Kind of deal. Yeah. Um, so we see the introduction of Loki and Sylvie talking to each other. Um, I guess uh, Loki revealing his plan, at which we already knew um, early on what he was trying to do. And that also confirmed our, you know, suspicions of him, you know, not being able to be trusted because he always has a plan. He always has a plan and he'll do again, whatever, whether good or bad to get it. Um, especially if there's power involved. Yes. Yes. Especially if there's power involved. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things you got from that scene where they're talking um, that you uh, found interesting um, before he jumps into I guess the door into wherever they end up next in episode three. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's fun to talk about two and three together because we initially see the Loki variant female form still wearing Asgard, almost the same costume, yeah. um, give or take the the headgear. And so, but then without seeing episode three, you don't have the the backstory for the character, so you're immediately thrown to is this is this actually lady loki i guess that's still a little i don't think it's unresolved but maybe some people still think it is but um yeah. so at that moment you're kind of thinking this is like is this literally lady loki from the run in the comics where they change the gender of the character um and you do see the i think the one thing you see that's like the similarity is even loki not knowing all the information is like well i'm going to overthrow the tba but then he's like do you want to be my lieutenant? As in, I'm in charge. So do you want to, do you want to fall in line? Be and be my the, sidekick. And the, yeah. And then the female variant is kind of like, well, no, like I'm I'm running my I've got my own. I got my own things on. Yeah. And it's not about you at all. I don't care. So yeah. Um, I think that was I think that was interesting without giving too much away. And then I thought it was a very cool sequence where she bombs the timeline. I thought that was that actually was a very neat like little twist of like when she, you're waiting for the explosion and there's no explosion and instead it's like all these panels opening up and then you see the timeline diverge a scene yeah. we had seen in the trailer without understanding what it actually was mm -hmm. um so that was actually super cool like a really that actually for me was the best action we've had yeah. in the three episodes yeah that um the beginning of those of, the, of that event and what it sets off is not going to be resolved in this series. This is obviously going to bleed into uh, Doctor Strange 2, multi most of, uh, Multiverse of Madness, uh, quite possibly into, and what's appearing, um, it'll be in Spider-Man 3 which we still have a show for, to, for you guys to um, um, to check out once we get a chance to, to do it because there's a big discussion there. Um, do you know Marvel? I think Marvel has a feel, pretty good feel for a number of things. I think the moment where the timeline is bombed, I think of it like the blip. Marvel understood that like when the blip happened, that bought them some stories, right? It's like, all right, now I have this time gap this event oh, yeah. that i can play around with but you can't do that for 10 years true so what they did was i think this is the second moment like that kind of if we say the blip is the first setting up the future from endgame mm -hmm. this is the second where the timeline gets bombed because now you have all these other stories and threads you can play around with as we move forward into phase four, I actually think you're going to wind up having, if you haven't seen Loki, you're going to want to watch episodes one and two as we get deeper into the multiverse. Yeah. Because I can't imagine they're going to have as detailed an outline of the rules 
anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, and so I obviously like for people like us, I think we're going to go back to these episodes and be like, hey, let's watch the Miss Minutes a couple just to be like, yeah, remind ourselves what we're what is supposed to happen, what can happen and why we're not yeah. breaking rules as we get these future movies. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to me and, and you pointed it out earlier um, when they when they showed the mo- the different um, um, versions of Loki. Could you picture yourself looking at that as Spider-Man? Could that be a sort of explanation to the different Spider-Mans that we got and, and they happen to be Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield? It makes kind of perfect sense, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the Spider-Verse in one spot. Yeah. Or Into the Spider-Verse, right? The Into the Spider-Verse, yeah. what we got as different yeah it all encapsulated into a summary yeah i mean that that would make perfect sense yeah so i can i you know what what i what caught my attention is i guess possibly the disappointment um that mobius felt when when time when when loki jumped into that uh that doorway because again it reaffirms um that Loki can be trusted. And that was a conversation that they had throughout the episode as well about trust, um, which I don't think Mobius trusted him um, at all. That's why he was calling so hard for him. It's not like he, you know, he, he felt like he wasn't going to do it. That's why he was calling Loki. Loki he was calling him, please don't do this. And he did it. Uh, so, and then that leads up to, to the, the, the third episode. You had anything to say before? We I was on? just going to say, I, I do think the expression on Tom Hiddleston's face in that moment, though, is significant because it's not the expression of a guy who has been planning all along to leave Mobius hanging. Yeah. It's the look of a guy who still has his conscience and who's weighing the risk reward of staying versus chasing. And he's making the call to go after her. Mm -hmm. I think that will come back around as the quote unquote right decision and not one that he made necessarily to betray Owen Wilson outright, but one that was like, hey, in the moment, the better decision was I can go after this person in a way that you can't and Mm -hmm. therefore going to do that. And it winds up then from a show perspective, it winds up separating them, which is clearly... Mm -hmm deliberate and probably needed to happen for a little bit albeit we'll talk about it not the most awesome 35 minutes but yeah (laughs) but i also have another theory in regards to why loki did what he did and and going after her it could be a part of him being able to catch her and 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 this would be the only way but also there was something interesting that loki said in their one of their conversations that he always likes to be right and if you notice that a lot of the conversation has to do with the real uh, agenda of the TVA or the, mm-hmm. the, the timekeepers and who they really are, Mobius has his belief of what this whole TVA thing is, and Loki questions it a lot. And I think he's also on a path to prove him wrong. Yeah, I agree. Now, what's one of the things I find myself in that, along those veins that's interesting, though, is I keep having to remind myself that this is 2012 Loki, not the Loki that dies yeah. in um, and, uh, uh, Infinity War. Yeah. Right. So I keep having to like remind myself of that. So I'm like, okay, what's freshest in his mind at this point is. He, he lived his whole life thinking he was Asgardian and then found out he was a frost giant pretty recently. So he yeah. really is living in a moment where he's like, wait a minute, everything I brought up to believe about myself was a trick. Onto yeah. himself. The trickster yeah. was tricked. Yeah. And then there's this gap of time, which maybe this show will help fill in, where he, he falls, you know, at, they're on the bridge in Asgard and he lets go and he disappears into space and then he resurfaces in Avengers aligned with the Chitari and Thanos. There's that gap, time gap there. That's all we have, right? Everything that came after, Dark World, Ragnarok, that hasn't happened yet to this character. Okay. So that's why I think, to your point, the notion of questioning everything, of, it, it makes sense because this Loki just had his entire world turned upside down. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. 
that's something also to, to think about what, what his motivations are. Um, and I think he has two. One, he wants to get that power, whatever that power is, that controls the TVA. And two, prove Mo- Mobius um, wrong about his belief and what the TVA and the timekeepers are, if they really even exist. So that leads us up into the third episode. Now, I did have one other question for you. Sorry, before we yep. with regard to Mobius. The, 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 the interaction between Mobius and his boss, what did you take from that? It, it, it seemed like the scene was tending toward that they had a relationship of some kind, but then it almost implied that there was more than one Mobius, like almost like Matrix style. Like there was, because he makes that reference when he puts the cup down of the tea where he's like, wait, and there's a mark where clearly there's been other cups of tea, but then mm. he seems like unfamiliar with ever having put the cup there. Yeah. What, what did you take from that whole exchange as far as like what's real, real about Mobius versus what, what they were trying to hint at? I really didn't notice that. I didn't notice that part. I, this is just, this is new to me. Uh, I understood that, that she has, one of the things that I got out of that conversation is she, she said that she's not she he's not the only analyst or right um, that she, that she has. Could she be referring to others of him? Because then she says when he puts the tea down on the poster, there's the mark of these other cups that would have been sitting on the wood, and she does make a reference to like he's the one that did it, not some other yeah. mystery and he seems very confused i just the way they filmed it made me think like i'm supposed to think that's a something and i i just was like what what is it it's like you because in the matrix there were six neos right yeah, and yeah, it's all yeah, confused yeah. at the end of that i'm like is that what we're supposed to think there's like we're not Multiple, necessarily seeing the same yeah. mobius every time i don't know but it could be interesting and that leads us up to the third episode mm-hmm. in understanding because when we open up um, with this shot of one of the Minutemen um, that she took in the, in the second episode, we see a shot of her, of Sylvie in her memory, t- having a conversation in a yep. diner. When I saw that, I was like, what is this? And then I sort of understood, okay, she's in her mind. But how is this part of her memory? If she was created by the TVA for the purposes of being a minimum or whatever the case may be. So I was left with that question, I, you know, and then I just kept watching the episode and, and, and now, and then it was confirmed somewhat, um, not to go too far ahead, but the conversation that Loki and Sylvie had a sort of a reveal to Loki about where they come from. But before we get into that, they through the time jump uh, or the time uh, door, they both land in this uh, event called Lamenti. Oh, Lamentis is it's like a Lamentis, a, Lamentis. A planet colliding with a moon apocalypse, basically. So this is uh, is this another uh, civilization altogether? This Earth or yeah? So the way I understand it is. Loki stumbled onto this pattern of she was hiding in these chaos events, the apocalypses. Yeah. So her pad is effectively a library of the apocalypses. God. So when you access, so it, you couldn't access like a sunny day, peaceful in New York in 2012. Like you would have to access one of the apocalypses. So when he activates it, he does so not really, I think, paying attention or knowing where they're going. Mm -hmm. And so that's when she's like clearly been there before because she's been to all of them. She's like, oh, not this one, right? She's like, this is horrible. Like we can't get out of this. This this stinks, yeah. So I think, I don't think we're supposed to necessarily draw a lot of conclusions from the world itself. It's just, yeah, they're thrown into it. So a lot of comments in this episode, if we we talk about sort of how exciting and great the second episode was this one was took a step back a real big step back in terms of action and uh i guess reveals about whatever is going on and until they have that conversation in the end 
Um, this wasn't a based on the conversations, I guess, that we've had and things that you've heard and people have said that this would be the best episode. Uh, the writer said that this would be a huge episode. And I, in, in, con in context, he wasn't incorrect because there were certain things that were revealed in there that certainly sets up us on a path of really finding out more about the timekeepers in the TVA. Um, but it was very, very slow nonetheless. If you think about there being only three more episodes left of this, and this, this one being the shortest one, yeah. um, what were your thoughts on episode three? I didn't really enjoy it. I think the comment that Waldron made, maybe I misunderstood it. He kind of said it as everything kind of break loose as of episode three. I don't know that he meant that as in self-contained episode three, but it definitely raised my expectations and I felt like the episode was disappointing. Um, I understand its purpose, which is they had to, they basically wanted an episode where the two of them could spend time together give us exposition about themselves. That yeah. is the only reason this episode is here. Well, I shouldn't say that, but that's mainly why we're here. It's yeah. let's take these two characters away from everything else we're doing and just have them hang out. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put something around it that's quite honestly kind of formulaic Marvel, right? It's like, yeah. you know, the hand, they're actually, it's funny you said there wasn't much, that, there was actually more, time spent fighting in this episode but it was kind of boring True. it was just like yeah, some hand yeah, to hand yeah. not really like i would have given a lot of money to see a lot more of the tricks and her enchantment in the mm -hmm. context of fighting as opposed to her just having one scream where she kind of yeah lets it loose and then that little scene at the beginning so i yeah, yeah. i didn't enjoy that part um my com you know my ongoing complaint with this show remains that i don't think they're utilizing the time travel and maybe it's a money issue, like I said, to actually transport you to really interesting backdrops or historically accurate. Like, you know, if I, if I draw an analogy, like Star Trek or Star Trek The Next Generation in particular, at its height, one of the strengths of the show was they would transport you, they would visit these planets or these societies that had echoes of like Earth history, but were different, had different rules. And you'd kind of be immersed in that. Mm -hmm. or the episode and so with this show i thought we were going to have some of that like i thought we would revisit you know like the revolutionary war or we revisit you know so, or some future space war that didn't happen and like or revisit marvel timelines that we've already seen because that's kind of been teased in the trailers yeah Maybe i think we'll coming. get that yes but like we haven't seen that to date we've kind of been visiting like things that are pretty nondescript like even this and i understand the color palette is has another significance which we can talk about but there's just nothing about this planet and its people and its struggle that really has any resonance. They Correct. just kind of are in it and trying to get out of it. So that's my like biggest complaint. And it made the episode kind of slow, quite honestly, as a result, even though it was short. Yeah. Time. So. So do you think she, she is enchantress? Or do you, do you agree? She is. I mean, what, they haven't named her as such, but they keep using the yeah. word. They call her Sylvie. How is she not? And she says, don't call me a Loki. I hate that. Like, I don't yeah, think she I, is I, a Loki. Yeah, I think if Enchantress is definitely, I mean, these people, you know, like, for example, Daredevil wasn't calling himself Daredevil in, in season one of Daredevil. You know, they were calling him Daredevil and it wasn't a name that he was necessarily taken. We know who 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 that person was, right? They just haven't taken up that 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 name you know like the way she took sylvie she's gonna take the name enchantress at some point possibly in the near future who knows mm -hmm. um but um what did you think when sylvie made that comment what was the comment that she made that made Loki say, what, what do you mean? Um, and it was regarding the TVA. Do you recall? Um, you mean the one where she tells him about the, like what's inside the woman's mind that she had a life yes. and a history prior yes. to being at the, so yes. the my, my biggest, re, my, so big reveal. It's a big moment. I think that actually probably resonates beyond this show. 
a very matrixy moment, right? This idea of like your life and your world is not your own. And these people live inside it, but don't actually know it. What I was unclear on was, did she know it? Or did she just stumble onto it? Like, did she go into that person's, the minute person's mind thinking, hey, I got a minute person incapacitated. I'm going to try to steal some information, some intel, and then just happen to kind of stumble into this and be like, wait, where am I inside the mind? Why does she have these memories? Because she kind of makes a reference to um, stronger minds. She has to mm -hmm. kind of cohabitate. She can't just totally take over. And so mm -hmm. I think she was implying that the minute person's mind, you know, was, was that way. She had to kind of go into her world to get the information. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't clear if she already knew going in that she was going to find something like that or whether that was a revelation. It clearly was to him. And I think it, you know, he was already asking those questions of like, wait, this can't all be face value, right? And now he gets the confirmation that Mobius and everyone he's encountered is might be, might be, we don't know everyone, might be a real person or a human, yeah. or a humanoid um, from, from outside the TVA to begin with. And that that's only going to heighten, I think, his... Yeah, they need to go. The timekeepers yeah. need to go, right? If yeah, they're brainwashing yeah. millions yeah. of people, then that, that, that's not that's not that's not going to stand. So, yeah, I don't know. It was it was a big moment, and it's a big it's a big rabbit hole. So we'll yes, see. yes, I kind of feel like we're not going to close. I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of it in this show. That's my feel. I think we may get closer and closer, but definitely not a. a, 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 a an answer or a resolve uh, a resolution in at the end of this it definitely is definitely gonna keep the needle moving on this because this is a i think this is something huge and for it to end here sort of puts and it obviously obviously it's not going to end because you know we have all this multiverse uh stuff happening um again and if you if you watched our our last um podcast we mentioned that hopefully at the end of this we get a tease if not me this a tease of um kang but if not whatever um but definitely we're not going to get a resolution to what's already been set in motion by sylvie i find it kind of kind of interesting because i always i don't for some reason i always um remember mobius is uh and this is going referring back to episode two um when they talk about the jet ski and yep. the way he sort of looks off to the side as if it's a memory that he wants yep. to relive so that when i when when i when i saw that it, it got me right back to that moment it's like this dude had his mind wiped yep <laughs> yeah you know it, it's a, it's it's a trope we've seen in a couple sci-fi movies it also reminded me this is not a classic but uh, Michael Bay's The Island. Uh, if you ever saw that, it was about 15 years ago. And it, the U, U. And McGregor is the the main character in that. He has this. He has the jet ski moment where it's like he is a clone who supposedly, but then he has a human sponsor who's out in the real world that he doesn't know about, and the clone starts drawing memories that the human has mm -hmm. that he couldn't possibly have, and that winds up being sort of a clue to like hey, there's something in this world that's not right. And I think you're you're hitting on something there that like yeah. his affinity for the jet ski out of nowhere is not actually out of nowhere. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. Um, I also think it leads also. to oh, mm -hmm. Mobius. I mean, it does seem to be setting up Mobius as a good guy in this, relatively speaking. Like he seems more inclined to join Loki's pause or whatever it becomes versus holding the line with the TBA. That, and I think the jet ski is a part of that. Like, I think Loki is having an effect in him and causing a little bit of doubt or, or, uh, or causing him to ask similar questions with regards to the existence of the TBA and the timekeepers. I think the more and more that they talk, because Loki, Loki continues to um, probe and ask questions and, 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 and instill some of that doubt into him. And I don't necessarily think as well that the, the TVA people, most of them could be, most of them are variants, but not necessarily bad individuals for the most part. All the, again, the, the thinking here is that all of the TVA 
employees have had their mind wiped and their variants and they, and, and they are employed if, to the TVA if they choose, I guess they have no choice if they have their mind wiped, but um, if there's some resistance to it, they just, just get erased, right? So um, do you think, and I think obviously, I, th I think you, you would agree that Loki is, has um, some sort of resource to get them out, out of the situation that they're in now. Um, and just holding off, I guess, to get, I guess, to find out some information from Sylvie, or I don't know what his end game for doing this um, and holding off their escape in order to get whatever information that he's looking for, whatever uh, uh, um, thing that he's trying to, to gain out of this situation. Do you think he has a, a way out of this situation and he's just holding on to it? There's certainly the possibility that the Tempad is in fully intact and he has it. That would not be the first time that Loki has used that kind of device where he's made it seem like either he's died or something's been destroyed and he's actually yes. had it. Yes. Uh, so and 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 that would fit with the idea that the whole point of this exercise was to for him to evaluate Enchantress and see can I work with this person or am I going to get stabbed in the back at every turn? That would yeah. certainly fit the the philosophy. The other would be um mobius rescues them because if, if we assume the temp pad is destroyed but mobius using loki's intel could actually figure out where they went could he come through basically and you know take them off the planet with sort of the time travel forth they have and then sort of reset that world that's a low i'd say that's a lower possibility but not an impossibility um mm -hmm. Well, he wouldn't have to reset that world because that's a, a, a you know, a oh, an apocalyptic yeah, sure. event. You could just let it play out. But I think like the other thing that was, I don't know if it's relevant or not, is this was the first time we've seen Loki try to change an outcome, right? So his detective work had said, if, a, if an apocalypse is going to happen, you can change whatever you want prior to the apocalypse. It's still going to happen and wipe out all the traces of it. So in this yeah. one, when they say, hey, we got to get that shuttle off the moon, that's the first moment where he's saying us being here, being who we are, we actually can change the outcome. So, so far that failed, but TBD, that'd be the other one is that there's another way for them to like so rewind get and redo that last sequence and solve it. I think the most likely one is he has the temp pad and yeah. he's had it the whole time and he hit it somewhere else. And now, you know, when he kind of sees her reaction to this, Mm -hmm. he'll then say like well we're we're fine and we've been fine the whole time yeah so yeah although episode three gave us a lot of intel it wasn't the strongest episode yet it's still my number one in terms of what has been released so far in terms of the series this is not my number one so far um, surprisingly, because we had it pretty low, you had it lower than, than I did. Um, has there been any, like, cause I, I, they usually, obviously they don't show a trailer afterwards. They usually release something else. Um, have you seen anything in terms of a I've preview? deliberately not watched it. So okay. the, the mid season update, I will. So I will say this one thing that I, as this, these episodes have played out, I'm really hoping for, and I think we're going to see is the less fighting that's in this show, the better the show is. Because Loki is not, like he uses his knives, but he's not a ninja. He's not. <laughs> and we saw that when they were fighting. It was kind of like, oh, we've seen this fight many times before, except it's done a lot better when it's yeah. Winter Soldier or Black Widow or oh, Captain yeah. America. Yeah. Where I think the action can really be strong, though, is like I said, in the moment where they bomb the timeline, it's the twist. It's the you know you're in this reality no you're not fooled you yeah, and so yeah, you know as yeah. i'm really hoping the showdown here is kind of between tva and them and it's just a series of chess moves of basically tricking and out tricking each other to get to an outcome i think that actually would be the best way to resolve this versus like hey we're building to tom hiddleston versus some tva and some physical showdown I, that doesn't make sense to me and i don't think it would look that great so i'm 
hoping that's not what we get in episode six. All right. Yeah, let let's see what happens. I, I think we'll still um, there. There still be a couple of episodes where we're going to be seeing Loki take on a few foes or whatever the case may be. But I hope there's a lot less of that and more of what you're describing um, to really keep us not necessarily interested in the show because we're definitely going to watch, but at least more high on the show as we've been for the first couple of episodes Th thinking about number three i think i have to rewatch it again it wasn't bad but it just wasn't as good as the first and second ones for you know because of how slow it was yet it still provided a lot of info information for us to to sort of talk about and really um break down right? i think it also i mean look let, let, let's let's be honest it was also there to confirm loki's sexuality as being consistent yes with the and that was a very significant moment, I think, for a lot of people. The color palette was designed to go with that. Uh, the director's been pretty open about that that was not an accident. That was done yeah. very deliberately. So I think for a lot of people, it was a pretty, re you know, we're talking about the episode in the context of furthering the narrative. I think for a lot of people, that moment was actually pretty significant. And so oh, yeah. there's a lot of people probably will point to episode three and say, this is where, like, you know, Marvel, Disney, the MCU kind of stepped up and said, we will honor that aspect oh, yeah. of the comic heritage of the character. And so I thought it was done, I thought it was done well in the sense of, you know, similar to Falcon Winter Soldier at its highest moments, not kind of hitting you over the head with the social message. Yeah. This was one that was just, it was done like very naturally in the flow of conversation as if like, yes, yeah, of course. Like, what did you think? You know, that kind of thing. I liked how they played that. Just, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, let it, let yeah. It, you know, let it out there without like putting a huge spotlight like look yeah. at us we're doing this give us credit for this like yeah similar to uh shit, shit's creek and when they had that moment of explaining how he feels towards that situation yeah it, that was a good call that, that, yeah that was that was um um a momentous uh scene and dialogue um any last words regarding uh the third episode we, uh, no, I mean, th so this show, I would just say, I mean, we, we could talk about MVP, but I don't even think it's competitive. I mean, Hiddleston's definitely still, I mean, he still carries, I mean, as good as Owen Wilson has been at being Owen Wilson, I mean, this episode, if anything, drives home, like Hiddleston is the lifeblood of the show and his oh, variety yeah. is everything. And his emotion, like when he plays it, yeah, this is a yes. show where it's like, I, I, can anyone really stand up to him? I mean, over an extended period of time? No, I don't think so. so he, he's far and away the, the franchise player. It's funny to, to to think about it when we got the well there there was a rumor and I and I think there was later a confirmation regarding a, a, a greenlit second season of of Loki mm -hmm. and we sort of understand why um, if it got leaked we understand why that they they're doing a second season of this because Loki being who he is and what he does allows the MCU to create or expand on the universe based on how much he's involved in, I guess, a lot of realities and a lot of things that occur. And he causes mischief and that mischief is the next set of events or next storyline or whatever the case may be for them to so try to resolve. So, uh, who knows if not only we get a second season or we might get a third, who knows? But um, so far, so good. And I'm really, really looking forward to, I'll be on vacation next week, but you best believe I'm going to look for some Wi-Fi. <laughs> and and I'm going to tell them, don't give me 56K modem. No, 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 no. Give me, y'all yeah, yeah, need to give me some good Wi-Fi so I can watch because I'm going to watch it. I, I won't be able to relax on vacation without watching the, the fourth episode of Loki. Um, yeah, that's our show for today on, on, on season uh, one of episode two and, and three of Loki. Anything else before we end the show, Brian? No, not Loki related, but early box office tracking 75 to $90 million open, opening weekend for Black Widow. I mean, they get anywhere close to that given where we've come from in the past, you know, 12, 18 months. I mean, we're back, I think, from a theatrical perspective. And Dude. with the same day, $30, day, uh, $30 Disney Plus offering. 
to do a, they were able to do a $90 million opening weekend with that alongside it. It's impressive. And, 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 and that $30 uh, um, fee to watch it at home is pretty easily trackable, regardless of whether you saw only 20 minutes of it and never got back to it. That $30 fee is something yeah. that is easily trackable and will be like, this This is going to be very interesting to see what sort of numbers we get with that $30 fee, mm -hmm. right? Um, because again, that's something that they keep all of it, right? They, they don't have to share that with anybody. So it'll be very, very interesting to see. For those people, let's say you didn't get tickets for this and you know that it's on and you can watch it home for $30, you're going to pay the $30. You're not going to, you know, wait till next week, especially if you're a Marvel head. You're not going to wait till next week or, or the next day to see if you got tickets, especially bad seats. Who's going to want to watch it in bad seats unless they just want to go for the experience of watching it in the movie theaters, which is yeah. fine. But me, myself, if I'm looking, let's say the Batman comes out and that weekend there aren't any seats available, uh, uh, seats available, I'm watching at home. If obviously when that comes out, they're not going to have that um, option to watch it at home. Uh, I'm going to do my darndest to watch it in the theaters, but if they were to have that option, because, you know, things can change. Depend Let's see what these numbers are. If they are, like, crazy, you never know. Brian, what do you think? Uh, I'll just say, I'm, I, I don't know what Disney will tell us exactly, um, but I am curious to see what impact the 30 day, the $30 because other movies where we've with H with Warner Brothers where they've been doing this because theaters haven't really been fully reopened and states rules and things have been evolving we haven't really gotten a great test of this idea of if you have it simultaneously what does that do to your opening weekend versus the staying power of the movie like to your point if there are people whose local theaters are you know they go to buy tickets and they're like oh it's sold out or people you know there's more people going than they expected you know those people probably more apt to pay the 30 bucks up front but if they pay the 30 bucks and everyone has a good time do those same people then say you know what a couple weeks from now i want to roll into the theater i actually want to see this like i actually wouldn't want to see it on the big screen opposite if you come out of it and you had a rock in time do you run home and pay the 30 bucks because you want to rewatch some scenes and like replay that like right away because you now can't like I'm curious to see like how it changes this dynamic of we're used to having these huge event first weekends then we get a 50 to 60 percent drop on the second weekend and if it's a good movie we kind of just level out from there like I am curious to see how this kind of skews that either way and I'm not convinced it's it's necessarily positive or negative yet but the fact yeah. that the tracking is let's put it this way coming off the pandemic i would assume any tracking number is going to be very conservative very conservative so for them to put a tracking number of 75 to 90 million dollars out there suggests to me there's potential for this to be big like big like pent up demand got to get to the theater big which you know i i'll stand corrected but this is not necessarily the film i would have thought would have had that much of a buzz behind it but it's looking like it might yeah I mean, there hasn't been a Marvel film that has been released from, I guess the last one was Spider-Man um, Far From Home. Yep. And now Weird. this is Black Widow. Yeah. And Black Widow got delayed over and over and over again just for this moment. Um... Would any of the films that were released by Warner Brothers had a, a fee uh, attached to it in order to watch it from home? No. No. So this is the true test right here. Subscribe and you get it. it subscribe and you get it. And you get yeah. it for a month. And then it would, you know, you could get it for a month and then it would disappear. That was it. Yeah, I mean, think about that. Like... And you get it for a month on, on HBO Max. Yeah, and then HBO pay. Max takes it down. Yeah, they, got, yeah. It, got it, got it, right. got it, got it. Hey, a lot of things to look forward to, a lot of interesting things to see what comes out of this experiment. 
Um, but yeah, that's our show for today. Um, thank you once again for joining us. If you remember, please hit that like and subscribe button, that notification bell. Um, that really helps support the channel. And share with your friends. And we will see you next time on the Nerd Gen.